Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 106, I chat with Bob Hodas about room acoustics and speaker placement. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded April 9th, 2012. Episode 106 Make Room for Acoustics. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, online editor of hometheater.com. This week's guest geek is Bob Hodas, an acoustician who has treated and designed the listening rooms of over a thousand clients around the world. So we're going to be getting deep into acoustics today. Hey, Bob, welcome to the show. Hi, how you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. How about yourself? I'm doing okay today. Good, good, good. Well, I got we got a lot of things to talk about today, and uh, but we do, I do want to also invite those who are uh, watching live at live.twit.tv or in the chat room at irc.twit.tv to post any questions you might have for Bob, and I'll pass along as many as I can during the show. So, Bob, you've designed over a thousand listening rooms all around the world, both professional and consumer. Uh, who are some of your most well-known clients, and can you share any stories from those experiences? Well, you know, I, I wouldn't say exactly that I've designed the ro- all the rooms. I've certainly tuned all of the rooms. Ah. Uh, sometimes I work with uh, with studio architects, and sometimes I work with uh, home theater contractors who hire me to come in and tune the systems once they've done all the construction and, and put things in. So it can go anywhere from me being involved with a room from the very first meeting with the client and, and building the place from the ground up, or I can be called in at the very end. You know, a lot of my work is um, is is sort of like I'm what they call the cleanup guy. Uh, somebody <laughs> might somebody builds a room, and then they're not so happy with the the way it sounds, and I get the phone call, and it's my job to go in there and figure out what's wrong, uh, you know, what needs to be done to make it work and make everybody happy. So, uh, you know, that's that's a, a lot of my work uh, in the but professional. That's, that's stu- harder. That's hard to do. Harder to do, isn't it? Than, than yes. to go from a room from scratch. Yeah, it's it's a lot harder actually. Uh, when when I walk into a room, if I mean if the room's empty, it's easy for me to figure out what it needs. But if a room has been treated, and in many cases, uh, one of the things that a lot of people do wrong is they over treat their rooms, especially when it comes to absorption. Uh, you know, they put way too much absorption in, and then we have to try to figure out. You know, we have to start tearing things out and and rebuilding. So, um, you know, the, the, it it becomes a puzzle. You know, and then you have to start taking out certain pieces and putting pieces back. And uh, it's it's much more complicated uh, once you know once the room has been finished. And of course, it's much more expensive because. Um, mm. Well, you know, uh, in a home theater, for instance, especially one with stretched fabric walls, you have to tear all the fabric off, you know, take it all off and find out what's beneath the wall and, you know, work with that and then put the fabric back back up again. So, uh, you know, the stretched fabric guys are not inexpensive. <laughs> So, well, so, tell us a story well, I, about like one of the most most difficult uh, jobs you had to do. Well, you know, I've had three or four rooms in my career where I actually told the people to tear the room down and start over. Wow, um, you know, uh, which is a really difficult thing to do. But uh, in in one case. The room was designed to be perfectly reflection-free, 
um, or first order reflection free by uh, a professor at 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 the local university. That, um, and so, uh, and he was he was hired by a, it was a mastering studio to to design this room. Uh, one room was was um, you know a housing ar- architect, a guy that you know designed houses, and his client said, "Hey, do you think you could help me with this this studio?" And and the guy had read some books, and he read a few more books, and he said, "Yeah, I, you know, I, I, this would be fun. I can do this." And um, that was basically an untunable room. That was just, there was nothing was going to happen with that. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, it's, but it it doesn't happen that often. I mean, generally we can, you know, go into a room and actually within a day kind of figure out what's right or what's wrong and, uh, and work on that. Actually, yesterday, you know, regrettably, I had to work yesterday. I was I was in the studio for about you know seven eight hours. Easter uh, Sunday. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, no rest for the wicked. You know. Well, that's for sure. Yeah. So, and this was my schedule is really nutty. Um, and this guy, uh, uh, just the way it worked out. You know. So I hope, I hope you paid. I hope you paid you double time or something. <laughs> Well, he paid me just fine, you know. I, Good. I, okay. I wasn't happy with the amount of money I made, let's say that. Okay, fine. Um, but, uh, you know, we started tearing a few things out, and he had uh, he had done, you know, some of the classical over-treating, and we went in there, and we re- we covered up some of the bass traps he had put in, and we moved the speakers, and we did a number of experiments. Uh, I, I mean, things that I find, uh, for instance... Uh, this fellow had, I mean, he, he was having a lot of problems with his low frequencies, his bass, and not being able to understand what was going on in the bass frequencies. And so, uh, I mean, one of the really interesting things that occurs is that he had a subwoofer in there, and as it turned out, simply the level was simply wrong you know he had too much sub turned up and it turned out to be out of phase uh, with his main speakers as well so he was getting a very skewed frequency response Mm -hmm. uh you know and and you know once we fix that then you know then everything sort of fell into line after that but that's not unusual i i find a lot of times that people you know, have polarity or phase issues uh, with their speaker systems. Um, right, right. But I've gone way ahead of your uh, your original question, uh, which <laughs> is, you know, fun fun jobs, you know, fun clients. And, and uh, uh, I'd say, you know, a few weeks ago I was in Stevie Wonder's studio and, you know, a week or two before that I was uh, doing a room for Green Day uh, for their, their new record. Um, uh-huh. Uh, and, does, does somebody like and, does somebody like Stevie Wonder uh, have have a good starting point uh, in in their room, or or is it one of these rooms that you really have to work hard to 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 tune to retune? I suppose. Well, it, it's interesting. Um, he has a very very good speaker system. We put a really good speaker system in there, and the room where he's doing his record, recording and mixing was built as a temporary space until they built the final the final studio, you know, the real thing. And so this room has its set of problems, but you know, we're able to you know, through proper speaker placement and the use in the studio, a lot of times we'll use equalizers. Uh, and I was able to tune something that, you know, that works relatively well. Uh, there's in the fu- sometime in the future, I'm going to do a little more acoustics work in his temporary room for him. But he's not really anxious to put a lot of, you know, a lot of money, time and money into into a space that's temporary. Yeah, um, really. You know, and, uh, you know, it's allowing him to do the work that he needs to do uh, in the meantime, you know, before he, you know, builds a full-fledged space. Um, he's a great guy to work with, you know. It, it's a, And uh, for me, it's a wonderful experience because uh, 
I get to listen to a lot of things that are sort of being recorded and rough tracks and just song ideas and things like that, uh, you know, that he uses to reference my tuning. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll go in there and I'll tune and he'll sit down and listen and then talk about what he's hearing and maybe we'll make some adjustments and, uh, you know, do, and the process starts again. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the final tuning of any room really should be done with your ears, not with a piece of analysis gear. Uh, it, I well, mean, this, this is an interesting, interesting point you bring up was one of the questions I wanted to ask you, which is, I know that you rely a lot on measurements and analysis equipment, but I wondered, I, I assumed you must also in the final analysis, uh, you know, use subjective listening to determine whether or not you have hit the mark or not. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, I mean, you know my background. I mean, I started out as a musician. I evolved into a recording engineer, and I mixed a lot of bands live also. Uh, and the the process of doing the recordings and being in all the different studios that I would travel to sort of got me into this whole room analysis deal and learning how to fix rooms. Uh, mm -hmm. It started out as a self-defense mechanism. Uh, and, you know, the the ears are the most important part of the process. Uh, I would, you know, I mean, Glad this, to I hear know, you say is, that. You know, this is controversial uh, for a lot of people, but I would never let uh, a computer tune my room. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's just let's just put it that way. Uh, well, that was know, the problem it, we ran into in, in that first room you told us about, right? Was a a professor who basically designed a room based on books and computer models, and that was it. Yeah, I mean that's true. My style of tuning uh, of, of wor working a room is different than a lot of these guys. There are a lot of uh, architects that do everything on paper, of course, and. Um, the rooms are built fully before anybody gets to listen to the room and uh, make decisions. It, it, you know, in a lot of cases, a lot of these guys are very knowledgeable and the rooms end up, you know, being pretty good. Certainly most of the recording studios have some type of equalization and some type of tuning in there because it's very important that we create a, a, a listening environment that the engineers and the producers can work in so that when they finish their project and they take it out to mastering, there aren't any problems to correct. There are maybe creative decisions to be made, but you're not trying to correct problems, or, you know, things that you, let's say you didn't hear in the studio or something mm -hmm. that was out of balance in the studio. And so you've mixed the record wrong, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, it's my style of working has developed uh, as a very empirical style. I, I'll try to go into a room as soon as possible when it's being built and start taking measurements. And then we'll start to make changes to the room and measure every step of the way so that when the room is complete, it's, you know, as good as it can possibly be. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so I don't, you know, obviously you have to start with basic dimensions and, and wall angles and things like that. But, uh, you know, but I start measuring at the, once the shell goes up and uh, so, because that's my service that I perform for my clients. Mm -hmm. you know? I was I mean, going to ask you the, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say a lot of the home theaters that I do, uh, are after the fact, you know, uh, projects for me uh, that I get called, I get called in at the end. And so, uh, you know, uh, home theaters uh, generally are not as ideal and acoustic as a, as a studio. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and many of the designers haven't been around for as many years as the guys who are designing studios. I mean, home theater work is fairly recent, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. It's it's not uh, it's not the thing that you, you have people uh, with you know forty years of experience doing, generally. You know? Right.
I do want to get more into the home theater side of things, but mm -hmm. I do have a number of questions in the chat room um, about uh, soundproofing or acoustic treatments uh, in home recording studios. And a lot of the people in the chat room are saying egg crates. I remember the day. I remember the days when people used to line their walls with with cardboard egg crates as acoustic treatment. Uh, but I assume that's really not a, a a good or viable way to effectively treat a room. Well, first I have to uh, air my dirty laundry here and say that <laughs> in 1969 or 70. Uh, I went out and got about a million egg crates uh, and, and when I was living in Tucson and my band would rehearse in my living room and uh, my whole living room was covered in egg crates. Covered in egg crates. <laughs> <laughs> so you have used this technique in the past. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, to tell you the truth, it's not all bad. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot better uh, – there's a lot better stuff out there today. Uh, there are actually companies that make real legitimate acoustic treatments. Uh, you know, an egg crate is, you know, the, I mean, the funny thing about an egg crate is that it's got this this surface that's semi-diffuse and it's got airspace behind the, you know, the compressed paper. And um, and so it's it actually you know, actually can be very effective in taking down a, a noise level of room. It's certainly no good for isolation, but it can, right. you know, you can affect the reverb time of a room and, and mm -hmm. you know, make it more intelligible with egg crates. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, there are a number of companies out there that are making, you know, dedicated uh, acoustic products that are specific to certain types of diffusion, um, you know, tuned bass traps, membrane bass traps are tuned to specific frequencies. Uh, also, broadband treatments. You know, panel acoustic panels, absorptive panels, and and uh, and broadband bass traps. So, th I mean, there's certainly you know lots of stuff around that uh, sure. that works and, and a lot better than egg crates. <laughs> <laughs> now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe. I understand, if I understand it correctly, there are essentially four different types of acoustic treatments that one can put in a room, um, absorptive, diffusive, reflective, and bass traps. Have I got that about right? Well, I, you know, a, a bass trap is sort of absorptive, absorptive trap. Guess, yeah. yeah, yeah. A bass trap is absorptive. Uh, and a diffusion, diffuser is reflective, you know, so... Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I never really thought about it as as uh, how many different types of treatments there are, mm. uh, but you know, like I said, a base base trap base is typically absorbed. There are uh, uh, very deep uh, diffusers that can diffuse base frequencies, and I know of a couple of rooms in Los Angeles that were built with these. I mean, there's there's uh, traps or diffusers that you would use in the shell when you're building the shell of the studio or mm -hmm. the home theater. And they're made from cinder blocks or a cinder block material. And there's very, very deep diffusers. Um, so uh, there was actually, there was a room in, in uh, Nashville in a famous studio, a Blackbird studio that has some the ceiling is very very high in there and there's some huge diffusers in the ceiling that are addressing uh, the bass frequencies mm -hmm. so uh generally people try to trap the bass uh there you know it's very rare that you would see somebody trying to diffuse the bass because i mean even with absorption you you need a quarter wavelength to really affect a a frequency, unless you've, you're use, utilizing a mel membrane or some type of type of Helmholtz uh, uh, absorber, uh, you right. you know, and and when you think about a hundred hertz being about an eleven foot wavelength, um, that's, that means you, you know, need that's a lot of depth that, are, that you need to absorb. That's yeah, a couple you know? two and a half feet or so. Yeah, yeah, and you can you know you can change things up. Uh, you know, make, let's say, a, a, a piece of compressed fiberglass more effective by standing it off of the wall. And so you can, 
you know, you can put it off the wall six inches or a foot or, you know, you could have, you know, a, a two foot airspace behind a, a four inch piece of compressed fiberglass. And it's going to you know go much lower than the specif- specification of that fiberglass typically mm-hmm. is. Um, mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, in the in the good old days, we used to do. Uh, a lot of trapping. The studios were built, you know, back in the 70s, you know, part of the 80s. There was a lot of absorption in the studios. But, you know, I'm the type of guy that I like a natural sounding room. Uh, it, the tendency in the home theaters is to do, in my estimation, too much absorption. And mm. I'm, I'm seeing a number of my clients uh, uh, for the home theaters are happier in a room that has a more natural acoustic to it. Um, I, nobody really likes to walk into a room and and feel like they're talking out of their chest. I mean, it's just not a comfortable feeling. That's and right. If, I remember I remember walking into an anechoic chamber, which is designed to have no <laughs> reflections whatsoever, and you feel really weird in there. Yeah, well, people freak out in those. I mean, that, you know, you listen to your carotid arteries pumping in your neck. Yeah. And it, you know, <laughs> It, yeah, it gets uh, pretty freaky. Uh, but if so. you try, but if you then, if you try to approach that in a home theater by by eliminating as much of the reflections as you can, you get some fraction of that same weird feeling. Yes, yeah, and and like I said, the big mistake that I think a lot of people make is that they will use, let's say, one inch or two inch thick compressed fiberglass panels or even if they're being green you know these the blue, the panels made from recycled blue jeans and things like that mm-hmm. uh, but they treat huge amounts of the room with these compressed panels and as we were just discussing you know the 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 uh you know the absorptive characteristics of a panel uh if it's 2 inches thick it's not going it's just going to be absorbing high frequencies and, you know, high mids and high frequencies. And all the base frequencies are going to go through that stuff just like a hot knife through butter. Just you know, like so, it's invisible, like it's not yeah, even there. It's invisible to them. So they're going to hit the wall and bounce back. And so you're going to have all your high frequencies sucked out of the room. Mm-hmm. And all the base is going to be rolling around and be extremely annoying. So it's mm-hmm. really important that you find the right balance, you know, that you have the proper, you know, reverb structure in the room so that so that you you know you have this sense of balance in the room uh and if your voice doesn't sound good in the room how is a speaker going to sound good (laughs) and it's not the kind of thing that you're going to really be very successful uh equalizing either you know i mean certainly well let's jack up the high end then you're putting stress on the on the speaker um right Right, no, and, the, mean, just, and those absorbers are just going to continue to absorb it. Well, they are. I mean, you're you're at some point you could you're trying to overpower what the room is taking out. Well, but, and this brings up a this brings up a really important point that I want to make sure we make, which is, correct me again if I'm wrong, but I think that the goal of any home theater or recording studio is to try to make the acoustics such that you don't need to use EQ or or to minimize the the use of EQ that it's much better to get the room right acoustically than it is to try and EQ the problems away yeah i for me EQ i mean EQ has let's say three functions but the the primary use would be icing on the cake okay mm-hmm. when i first approach a room uh most of what i consider that i can do to create a good listening environment is to find that one spot in the room where the speakers want to be and the listener wants to be. So that's analyzing all the boundaries and the reflections from the boundaries and moving the speakers around and moving the listening position around and trying to optimize the frequency response by, you know, creating this area where you know the boundary reflections aren't coming back out of phase at the uh, listening position and causing cancellations comb filtering and such and that's the majority of what i can do to tame a room 
is mm -hmm. is to get you know first optimize the speaker placement. I mean to just put a speaker in a room and then say, well now we'll just equalize it. I I mean it, and and the the history if you want to you know like go back quite a ways to the early days of recording the everything we didn't have equalizers in the in the early days of recording to you know to equalize an in, the sound of an instrument it was all done with mic placement and mm. an instrument has different sounds at different parts in different parts of the room and the body of a violin uh, or the a saxophone or you know a piano all these things that if you move a microphone an inch or two around these instruments you're going to ch change the way that instrument sounds you know in the recording in the recording and, right yes yes and so and the you know the same applies you know, the same applies with the room. You, you know, you have to start with a good foundation. If you don't have a good foundation, you're really never going to get the, an optimal, you know, listening environment. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 so, exactly so, yeah, right. so get those speakers as close to where they need to be in the room as possible. Uh, because, you know, just you know throwing equalization at something is i mean it's uh you know i mean it's not going to sound as good and you're trying to make the speaker make up for a room that's uh, for a problem that's room oriented you know right. most people right. are designing speakers that work pretty well in a in an anechoic environment uh i mean nobody knows what kind of boundaries you're going to have uh on a speaker most rooms are different, you know, I mean, the, right. dimensionally, right. they're different. So we, you know, find, find that spot, find that magic spot in the room, <clears> I'm, the speaker, I'm gonna... then, then you can address things acoustically. And now right. you, now, you know, you know, you can say, well, is this, is this problem I'm seeing in the speaker? Is it a front to back problem? Is it the front wall and the, the back wall? You know, is it simply, you know, modal distribution are the, is it a reflection that's coming off of the off the ceiling or off of the mm -hmm. side walls and then you track down you know where these reflections are coming from and you apply the appropriate treatments to those reflections to try to you know normalize the uh, the frequency response in the listening position so and it sounds like that I'm sorry. Well, I was going to summarize for you, but you're already doing it for me. Go right ahead. Well, I was going to say once. So once. So yeah, speaker placement, acoustic treatments next. Then you know, if need be, apply some equalization. And right. And let me say, there are certainly instances where I've gone into a room, and I've said, "Well, we need to move this wall." Uh, and they said, "Well, that's just not possible," or the room is so small that there isn't any effective bass trapping that could be used in there. In a case like that, what, you know, what what tools do I have left? I've got an equalizer. That's you know, mm -hmm. uh, but that's a last ditch effort. Uh, right, right. You know, now there, you know, I have to also say, you know, I mean, our focus is home theater, and so you don't really find. Uh, personality curves that much on home theater. I mean, some guys might like their surrounds a little louder. Or they like their ba their LFE channel jacked up a bit. But everybody mm -hmm. pretty much wants a, a linear response out of their system. In the studios, that's not always the case. Some uh, some producers and engineers want a, a, a fairly linear response from the system in the mid-range, but they might want, you know, they might listen very loud, so they want some of the high frequencies rolled off so they can turn their speakers up louder. They might want the bottom jacked up so they can have some fun when they're, when they're doing the mixing. And these guys, you know, learn their rooms, and so when they take the recordings out to mastering, the recording is what they intended it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, home theaters typically aren't that. We try to follow, you know, follow the the um, guidelines or or the standards, I should say. You know, Dolby has a a standard. There's a standard for you know uh, 
low pass filters on the on the LFE channel. There's a standard for level. Um, you know, there's standards that we need to follow uh, mm-hmm. when we're when we're putting home theater together. In fact, this brings up a question from the chat room, and I've got quite a few that I'd like to get to. Uh, Luis asks, uh, is the tuning reference for a room uh, flat, in quotes? Ah, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, which, which I, th- I suppose we should suppose I suppose we should uh, define as being, you know, basically flat as as the response is the same at any frequency. Yeah, correct. From 20, 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, that mm-hmm. if you put a microphone in front of a speaker, you measure a flat line. And that's, right. you know, that's how speakers are pretty much designed for anechoic environments. Right. Uh, 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 speaker designers want their system to be flat. I mean, there are some guys that design personalities into their speakers. i I'm not a fan of those types of speakers generally, but right. uh, yeah. So in the recording studio uh, for broadcast work, generally I'm trying to get a system as flat as possible for the music studios. Most people don't like flat and they won't make a good sounding record on a flat system uh, in the home theater environment. Generally, we're also going for a flat response. Um, I, w- what I would like to see happen in a reproductive room, uh, it, it, something like a home theater, uh, mm-hmm. is that they get to hear what the producers and engineers intended them to hear. This uh, is always my goal, too, in a home theater, both audio and video. Um, and so, and so you think you do need a relatively flat room in order to do that. Yeah, I, I believe for a home theater or an audiophile listening space, now, like I said, I, I've got clients that just like to hear more bass. Um, I've got some clients that have some speakers that get very aggressive when you listen to them at certain volumes, and they want that aggressiveness kind of trimmed out a little bit if possible. Um, those are preferences that that I think are, you know, legitimate preferences, you know, according to the client. You have to remember that hearing is the least understood sense that we have. You know, in order for them to study your ears, they have to kill you and and remove the (laughs) Uh, you know they don't they don't get to study our hearing till we're dead really you know uh you know they can't look and see how the ears are working or what's going on in the cochlea you know without destroying your hearing eyes are completely different things you know i mean uh there's it's just a much more it's the most complex sense we have and we all pretty much can agree on flesh tones in a video projector sure or that this this is blue and this is green i mean that people universally um can agree on that sort of thing but a lot of people don't agree on what sounds good uh you know there's (laughs) you know there's people that have preferences and they hold to those preferences very strongly so if I tune, if I go in and I tune a home theater, it's just like, well, working, you know, with Stevie Wonder in his studio. Um, if I go and I tune, uh, you know, when I tune George Lucas's home theater, I tune it to the standard. You know, he's a professional. That's, you know, what he's looking for. When I do, uh, you know, when I do a studio for Shaq, you know, when I tune his studio, he wants the low frequencies extraordinary. You know, so <laughs> he wants so he wants boom and bass. He's looking for boom and bass. Okay, so if that's what Shaq wants, little be it for me to say, "Oh no, you can't have that. You have to conform." <laughs> it must and, be flat. Yeah, yeah. It's like I'm out of there. You know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, is, you know, you'll give him what he wants and take his money. That's right. But in, in a case like that, flat's a great place to start because, once again, it lets you hear what, you know, what the producers, uh, you know, the, uh, the directors, in this case, directors, 
intended you to hear. This is, mm-hmm. this is what they're looking for. You know, I have a lot of, a lot of my clients, I mean, aside from, you know, I do, you know, I've done home theaters for a lot of guys in the industry, uh, you know, uh, you know, George Clooney or, you know, George Lucas or, you know, well, Shaq's not exactly in, in the industry, although he has a little studio, he, you know, he does some stuff, but I do a lot of the rooms for the composers, you know, James Newton Howard and mm-hmm. uh, 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 Danny Elfman, uh, guys that are creating, you know, the soundtracks for the movies, you know, so th- it, there's, I've had a, the opportunity to hear what these guys are intending you know, when they're in the studios working. Right. And then also a lot of the mixers are clients of mine, Chris Boys, Laura Hirschberg, you know, Oscar winning mixers, you know, film mixers, uh, you know, uh, Alan Meyerson, you know, people that are mixing huge, you know, huge hit films and, you know, what their, what their standards are, are very important to me. You know, I, I mean, this is a, luckily for me, I've gotten to, do so much listening in a, a wide variety of rooms um, that, that, you know, that I have a really good handle on, you know, what a room is to, you know, should to make this translation, you know, and, and, mm-hmm. and to provide the, provide an, a, a uh, what do I want to say? Give people the emotional experience that the artists are intending them to have. That's really what it's all about, to evoke Indeed. those emotions, you know, yeah. to, you know. Well, this, th- that's exactly right, and I couldn't agree more. Um, and I know that we've got a lot more questions in the chat room that I want to get to uh, very shortly. Uh, but before I do, I do want to th- take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, which is Netflix. Now, most of our uh, viewers and listeners uh, to this show already know about Netflix. Most of you probably already have it. You know that you can get thousands of uh, TV episodes and movies streamed directly to your TV or your PC or your game console or your iPhone or uh, Android phone or Windows phone, I've uh, recently learned, uh, or tablets. Just about anything, any consumer electronics device these days has a Netflix app allowing you to uh, bring in uh, Netflix streaming content and play it on your TV or your computer, or your smartphone, or your tablet. You can even start on one device and finish the same program on a different device at a later time. It's great for uh, finding content that you wouldn't otherwise normally be able to find on Blu-ray. I use it to to do exactly that. I've I've found a number of things to watch that, uh, you know, aren't readily available on Blu-ray, but there they are on Netflix, uh, making it very easy to to enjoy that content. Now, uh, Twit listeners and viewers, of course, are uh, are being offered a 30-day free trial for uh, to check it out. And I sure hope that you will do that if you haven't already. Just go to netflix.com slash twit. Uh, and be sure to use that URL, if you would, please. Netflix.com slash twit. And we thank Netflix for their support of Home Theater Geeks and the entire Twit Network. So, Bob, uh, got a bunch of other questions in the chat room. Let me quickly, let's quickly run through some of them. So Cal Ray Jr. asks, what kind of gear do you use to analyze a room? What, what kind of measuring equipment do you use? Okay. Well, I have uh, some really ancient polarity testers. Uh, that was actually the first tool that I ever bought. Uh, these things are, are ancient. And, uh, you know, I use them all the time. But now this, uh, this is the, to, to test the, uh, this is the phase. Test the, uh, this, well, well, it's let's say this. It will tell me whether uh, the speakers are moving in the uh, in the same direction or not. You know, polarity right. is is simply uh, is the is the air being compressed or rarefied uh, when you put a, a, a impulse into into a speaker uh, and. You know, people have to recognize that all speakers aren't designed to have all the components necessarily moving in the same direction at the, at, you know, at the same time. Uh, under a, a given lot, stimulus. Yeah, under a given stimulus. So, so uh, sometimes one of the tricks that a lot of studio uh, speaker manufacturers use 
uh, when d making near field monitors is to reverse the tweeter from the mid range polarity wise or the tweeter from the woofer, you know, in polarity. And what they accomplish, and this has become a, because of the design of the cabinet, uh, what they accomplish is they make the speakers in phase at the crossover point, which is that's the important you know transition. And so, uh, and sometimes the way that you do that is you flip the polarity on one of the drivers. Now, uh, you know, other cabinets are all the speakers are running the same polarity. So it, it's you know you have to know what the manufacturer is intending when you test the speakers. You certainly mm -hmm. don't want to go and start flipping, you know, speaker polarity and and not be able to actually see the phase when you do it. Of course, if you've got real good ears, you can hear the phase. You know, right. you can hear hear the phase cancellations and go, well, this is wrong. Um, but, uh, you know, the polarity tester is a very basic tool for me, and, uh, and, and I'm using it, you know, I'm using it constantly. Uh, I should say that, you know, because of this, depending on the acoustical... Uh, interaction of the speakers the position of the speakers in the room i mean sometimes you know woofers may be positioned so that they uh, or let's say subwoofers are positioned so that they're actually out of phase with the woofers in the main system uh just because of their physical location in the room and so you need to flip the polarity in order to get them in phase at the crossover point mm -hmm. uh, so you, I assume uh, you use like a real time analyzer and other things like that. Well, what? Yeah, I was going to say we're spending. Oh, sorry, tons I'm, of time. I'm, pardon me. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. We're spending all this time on polarity, but you know that's a that like I said that was a very basic tool uh, to start with. Uh, the thing that I really do all of my analysis work with is a. It's called a Sim System Three. It's a third version of the Meyer Sound Laboratories SIM, which stands for Source Independent Measurements. Mm -hmm. And it's a dual-channel FFT analyzer. It uh, uh, displays uh, frequency response, phase response, and coherence all in real time for me at 48th octave resolution. Uh, oh, wow. I can smooth... I can smooth it out if I want. I can do smoothing. Uh, generally, I tend to like to see things at high, you know, in high resolution. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, that's the tool that I currently use, the, which is the latest version of, of that tool. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, so I can see phase. I look at, you know, phase in the linear domain. Um, and... Uh, it's, uh, you know, to me, phase is as important as frequency. Uh, you know, I think that the, the tighter the phase, you know, the, the, uh, the flatter the phase of a, of a speaker, uh, the more realistic uh, the, the instrument pr reproduction is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful experience to sit and listen to a speaker that has, you know, very tight phase response, very, you know, uh, fairly flat phase response and have the, you know, the bass frequencies arriving at the same time as the high frequencies. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, you hear so much depth, you know, you get, uh, you get such this, you know, this great feeling of, of, depth in the recording and and the realism you know the the reprojection of the of the uh of the music uh just you know a realistic uh, rep uh re reproduction of the music you know what can i say so now, yeah go ahead no no go ahead. no please i was going to say lawn dog in the chat room asked a related question which is uh, you were talking about your, we're, we're talking about phase obviously here, and you you mentioned it earlier that the subwoofer was out of phase in a, in a room you were working on, uh, and he asks, are we talking about direct wiring or is there a switch on a piece of equipment that's wrong? Ah, well, in this particular case, um, uh, you know, it's hard to say what was wrong with this particular interaction. Uh, we reverse simply reverse the polarity on the subwoofer uh, using the speaker wire. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And, uh, but I don't, I did not, you know, uh, because of the location <laughs> of the subwoofer, which was underneath the console, which was stuffed full of equipment. And so the, the engineer crawled underneath the console into the, into the front of the room and did the work for me. I just sat at my gear and said, you know, do this, do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was looking at my screen and the computer asking him to try different things for me. Um, some subwoofers, especially the active ones today, uh, come with a polarity switch, you know, you'll have a switch that shows you zero, what they call zero phase or 180 degrees, you know, uh, right, of right. phase reverse. Some have a knob that you can spin. Uh, some have, you know, little, you know, micro switches that you might be able to do zero, 90 degrees, 180, 270. Uh, right. Some have, you know, you know, very infinitely variable knobs. You can go, you know, up to 360, uh, you know, degrees of phase. So, and some have nothing and, the, you, you know, all you can really do is flip the, you know, flip the, the cables or flip the input polarity on the connector. Uh, right. So, you know, there's something for everybody out there. If, if I have a wish list for a, for a, a subwoofer, of course, it's going to, it's going to include uh, some kind of variable phase switches you know, or, mm -hmm. or knobs that give me some, uh, give me more than just a polarity flip, but more than just 180 degrees. It just right. is one more, uh, you know, tool in my creative toolbox that allows me to really fine tune. And with, with the, the fact that I can see phase, I mean, I could see a five degree shift in phase. Uh, I can really dial in, uh, the the uh, a subwoofer with a main with a main speaker system. I mean, I can get the that thing really, really tweaked in uh, properly, so that you don't really have any concept that you've added a subwoofer to the system. I mean, if you integrate a subwoofer po properly, you have a very very hard time uh, uh, hearing that it's. That it's a separate component. It really mm -hmm. appears to come from the main speakers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. F loop in the chat room asks: uh, Do the room tuning principles outlined in Floyd Tool's book, uh, Sound Reproduction, correspond with with your experience and and um, preferences? Well, you know, I hate to say it, but I haven't read Floyd's book. Oh. So uh, you know, no, no, I, I have. I have had plenty of conversations with Floyd, and and. Um, uh, you know he's a great guy and uh and and really smart and um you know we've talked about things like parametric equalization and you know uh room acoustics and things and yeah i'm going to probably just offhandedly say that most likely i agree with uh what floyd's <laughs> written in his book just because uh you know generally he and i have seen eye to eye on a number of different points sure uh, you know, I mean, that doesn't mean we don't have our differences or wouldn't, but, um, you know, I, I haven't had much to argue with Floyd about, that's for sure. No, I understand. He's a very, very smart guy, and, and he's been a guest on this show as well. Um, so I'm glad to have more than one perspective on, on acoustics and so on. Um, uh, SoCal Ray Jr. asks, do you use, a single, do you use single point measurements or, or do you average multiple mics? He's well, getting pretty geeky here. Yeah, yeah. It, well, look, let's just say this. If you average multiple microphones, you can't see phase. And ah, uh, of course. Okay, of course. so, and to me, phase is really, really important. And I'm also, you know, I mean, I look at lots of different things. I look at impulse response of the speakers so I can identify room reflections and things like that. I want to see reflections that are coming in out of phase. Uh, so... To answer the question, I I take multiple shots in a room in different positions, and then I I don't let a, a computer um, combine them for me. I look and do uh, you know do the averaging in my brain. I use you know my my common sense and I use my experience. 
to decide what's important and what isn't important, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, and what positions, you know, have more weighting and such. So, uh, so I use, you know, my system will handle up to 64 microphones, but, uh, but I'm generally using one microphone and I'm moving it around the space. It's, it, you know, it's very important to, to, uh, you know, especially if you want a big wide sweet spot to, you know, to, ha- to know what's going on three feet left or right of the microphone or sometimes three feet in front or behind, you know, a, a specific chair. Mm-hmm. In a recording studio, it's less important than it is, let's say, in a home theater. You know, in the recording studio, you're often, you're trying to give somebody a nice wide s- sweet spot across the the width of the console, but, right. uh, you know, he's the guy that's making the decisions. The, you know, the engineer's making the decisions and what goes on in the back of the room isn't all that important. Uh, mm-hmm. In a home theater, you wouldn't want to just take the, what I call the money seat in the home theater. Let's say it's a three-row theater. Uh, you wouldn't want to simply make all your decisions based on the best seat in the house uh, because he could be sitting in a mode you'd wind up, let's say, in the equalization land, boosting a frequency that would turn out to be way overdone in the back row, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and you'd be just, it would be an onslaught for those people back there. You know, you have to come to some kind of compromise when you're trying to uh, trying to go for a, a multiple seat room. You know, mm-hmm. it's important to have that compromise. So now, averaging, where, averaging certainly has its place, mm-hmm. but I don't let the computer do it for me. Uh, what kind of microphone do you use? Uh, Tinker Toy Tech is asking. I use a B and K omnidirectional microphone. Mm. Now, one more question before we go, because we only have a few minutes left, um, and that is: How do you approach? Speaker placement and subwoofer placement. What kind of guidelines can you offer people? to to get their speakers and their subwoofer where they will do the most good, where they will sound the best. You were talking earlier about, um, you know, the, how, how important. First of all, it's important to get the, to get the room right, uh, get the speaker placement right. And so uh, I wonder if you have any sort of general guidelines along those, along those lines. Okay. Well, I'm not really a, a believer in rules of thumb too much. Uh, you know, generally... You know, one rule of thumb is, is well, the speaker should be two feet from any boundary. You know, it, that's kind of a restrictive uh, rule depending on the size of your room. Mm-hmm. I mean, one thing that I think is, is important for imaging is to be reasonably close to an equilateral setup so that your left and right speakers, the distance between the tweeters in the left and right speaker are basically the same distance as to the listener's head. Uh, and uh, for a lot of my clients, I I actually like to put the listener inside of that uh, that equilateral point, the point where the where the speakers converge. And I find that it just gives them a, a larger sweet spot. Uh, so so that's one thing. You know, that's a good starting point. And you know, and hey, two feet from the boundaries—that's that's a good starting point, also. But what I try to do is, I'll let's say pick a spot for the speakers, and you know, it's it's a bit of a crapshoot to start. You know, unless you've got a perfectly rectangular room, and you can do boundary interference pattern analysis, um, you just have to kind of, you know. Uh, say, well, my speakers, you know, the manufacturer intended me to be listening to my speakers but from six feet to 12 feet away. Okay. And, and that gives you, starts to give you some guidelines of how far away you can be from the speakers. So how wide can the speakers be, you know, in your room? And you right. just simply place a, the speakers and hopefully your room is symmetrical. We didn't talk about symmetry, but if you don't have a symmetrical boundary situation, uh, your speakers, you're never going to get good imaging out of the speakers. 
Um, so symmetry is is very very important. And if you've now, got by symmetry, sy- pardon me for pardon me for interrupting. By symmetry, do you mean rectangular, or could it be a non rectangular room as long as it's symmetrical? Oh no, non rectangular is fine as long as it's symmetrical. And I'm also talking about placement of you know uh, equipment or furniture in the room. So, um, you know, you know, certainly you don't want, I mean, one thing that's bad is you have a wall on one side and then the, uh, you know, on the, uh, on your right side, you've got a wall and on the, uh, up, uh, on the left side, you've got the entry into the living room, you know, which doesn't have any doors or something. I mean, those are, right, sure. you know, common issues that we often see and, and, uh, you know, at least have your speakers so that the immediate boundaries are, you know, are symmetrical so that they're pushing, you know, kind of pushing the reflections out in, in a fairly symmetrical, uh, uh, you know, first order reflections get pushed out in a fairly symmetrical way. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, this is a complex thing. We'd have to sit there with a white of course. and start drawing of around. But yeah, but um, so but as far as you know, what do you do? Okay, so you, so you pick a spot and then you start, what I do is I start moving the microphone left to right and front to back uh, and kind of taking a look at, you know, what are my peaks and valleys in the frequency response? You know, where are the holes? Where Where's the buildup? And I try to identify uh is this reflection a front a front to back problem? You know, am I getting this cancellation when I move the mic front to back? Do I get it when I move the mic side to side? You know, what boundary is is causing this specific problem? So I mm-hmm. try to pick the problems specifically uh, and address them. And then I might say, well, I have some restriction as to where, you know, I want the listening position to be. So then I'll go and I'll start to move the microphone or the speaker forward and backwards in the room, uh, side to side, I'll start to angle it, uh, you know, and generally six inches at a time, you know, I'll, I'll start to look for trends in six inch movements. Now, you know, once you've identified, you know, a spot for your speakers, um, you know, you could affect imaging, uh, and, you know, highly refine, you know, your listening experience by moving speakers very, very small increments. But, uh, you know, to try to uh, analyze what what's going on in the low frequencies. I mean, this is the foundation of the music is mm-hmm. is the bass response. You want your bass response to be as smooth as possible. So some, pe- some people in the chat room are asking, do you get that by, can you get that more easily with multiple subs? Well, yes, yes. In fact, um uh, multiple sub, I, well, I should start by saying that I'm, you know, in a stereo system, I'm a stereo sub guy. I, you know, I mean, I, I believe in stereo subs and in a home theater, uh, yeah, there, there can be a large advantage to having multiple subs in the LFE, uh, channel and, uh, of course, proper placement, um, uh, I think when Floyd was actually when Floyd was at uh, at uh, Harmon, uh, there were some studies done that um, that uh, you know they did with placing multiple subs around the room. In fact, I think th- you know they they started off with one sub and added another and added another and added and then added another, and they kind of came to the conclusion that. Four subs were the best, and five subs or more was not so good. You know, you start to get degradation, and there are some formulas for um, for placement. You know, where to place these subs in the room to get the most even distribution of of uh, base response throughout the room. I mean, basically, right. you take a placement, and then you can kind of fill it in with another sub that's placed in a different spot. So you you can make up for, you know, bad boundary situations by, you know, continually moving the speakers around and find out where does, you know, where do these subs interact so that they give you the the largest sweet spot and the smoothest bass response. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'm I'm definitely a multiple sub guy. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, uh, Bob, I'm afraid we've come to the end of a fascinating hour. I want to thank you so much for being here and sharing your knowledge and wisdom on the uh, whole subject of room acoustics and speaker placement and everything else. There's so much more we could be talking about. I hope you'll come back sometime again. 
Scott, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'd love to come back. It, it's a lot of fun. The listeners had great questions, I should say. That's, I, I mean, you, I think you've got a high quality of listener here because I, you know mm. they were asking very intelligent questions. Uh, yes, it, it was I, I couldn't agree fun. more. Yes, thank you. The, uh, the chat room is quite remarkable, and uh, I always uh, value their input very highly. So uh, thanks again to Bob Hodes for his uh, uh, very interesting information. You can reach him uh, and read all about his projects and stuff at uh, bobhodes.com. My online home, of course, is hometheater.com, and you can email me at scott at twit.tv. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter at HTGeekScott. Next week, I'll be at the National Association of Broadcasters Convention with the entire TWIT team. And uh, we'll be doing home theater geeks right there from the show floor. I'll be there with Leo himself, the chief TWIT. Uh, we'll be visiting uh, booths such as Canon and Panasonic, JVC, and I think Sony is on our list. And we'll be seeing what's new in the world of broadcasting. And in particular, I'm going to be looking specifically at how the world of broadcasting, what we see at the NAB show, uh, translates directly into the consumer experience. So I sure hope you will join me for that. It'll be a special edition of Home Theater Geeks live from the show floor at NAB. Until then, geek out. <laughs>